Welcome back, everyone, to These Aren't the Nerds You're Looking For. Uh, episode 28 here, Mystery of a Thousand Moons. 25th yeah. episode of The Clone Wars. That is Season 1, Episode 18. This is Kevin Horde. Uh, Lorenzo Fon over here on this side. Did we do that already? Did we do that twice? No, we. I don't I don't think you did say it. No. Okay. You skipped over that part. That's yeah, fine. Yeah, I do that sometimes. They know who we are. That's fine. What do we got going on this episode? We uh, we got a mystery of a thousand moons. Yes. This is what production code two o two and was released on February thirteenth of two thousand nine. Uh, does yeah. that date sound familiar to you, Lorenzo? Uh, yes, because that would be the same day as the episode we talked about last week. That is correct. Uh, so I yeah, it was a- did not notice this last week, but. Uh, <laughs> It is. And so uh, we, near the end of last week's episode, we were talking about uh, production codes or, I don't know, maybe it was earlier in the episode, beginning, middle, end. I don't know. It happened sometime. Somewhere in there. But uh, we were talking about how uh, the blue shadow virus, right, was the last production quote-unquote produced episode of season one and then this would have been the second of season two so mm-hmm. i think i know what happened yeah what happened there i was watching the behind the scenes stuff on the dvd and killian plunkett the art director said this episode being mystery of a thousand moons never was supposed to happen and he said interesting he said occasionally uh george lucas will see one of the stories mm-hmm. and like it and then decide and declare that there's a going to be a prequel to it or be a sequel to it. Yeah. So we have blue shadow virus. That was one twenty six. Then two Oh one was hidden enemy, which is a prequel to the new Padawan AKA the movie. Right. And then we have this mm-hmm. one, which is 202, which is a sequel to the Blue Shadow Virus. So what I'm thinking happened is that season one production was done. They had all this stuff. Mm-hmm. And this is the time that George Lucas came in and said, oh, you know, I like these four things. We're going to put them together and uh, put it out as a movie. And uh, then you guys need to work on I got I got a couple ideas for you. You need to work on this thing. That's going to happen before the movie. That's going to tell this story. And then uh, after this uh, virus thing, we got, we got this, I got this other idea. So here's what's going on with that. And the whole thing with that was that he, he devised this, this plot line of uh, Diego, the planet and all the moons Mm -hmm. around it. And they had to go on like a treasure hunt, which is kind of what we got going on here. So it was George Lucas himself that said, Hey, time out. I got these two stories that you guys need to do. One is the prequel to the movie, and one is the sequel to this other story. So that Mm -hmm. really is encapsulates like all of season one. And George said, Nope, we're putting this thing before it, we're putting this thing after it. So I think that it is interesting that Blue Shadow Virus and Mystery of a Thousand Moons aired on the same day. Yeah, I didn't see what the reasoning was behind that. So but. they do it occasionally where um, what happened is that there was – Trespass was on January 30th, and then there was like a two-week break, and then they mm-hmm. and then they put two episodes out. Mm-hmm. So I don't know why they wouldn't – there wouldn't have been an episode like the first week of February – because it's not mm-hmm. like it's not even like they skipped like the week of Valentine's Day or something. Yeah, because they maybe Super Bowl or something. No. Did they not want to compete with Super Bowl ratings or? No, because the show comes out on like I think the show comes out on like Thursday or Friday if you look at whatever two thirteen oh nine is. Yeah. So they just oh I got nothing. I don't know, but even after Mystery of a Thousand Moons, then you don't get an episode for two weeks, and then there's Storm of Ryloth. I wonder if it was like sweeps week or something, maybe like February sweeps. Like I don't know. 
So Cartoon Network really just want to build up the anticipation for this one hour event of Clone Wars to show off to the the advertisers like, hey, look, see, people do watch the show. Yeah. Like 18 episodes in and we're good. We're rolling. We're rolling with it. Right. Yeah, I guess so. I'm not really sure. Um, one other interesting thing before we hit the fortune cookie and roll is, or I guess maybe two things. Uh, mm-hmm. On Netflix, the title of this episode is listed as Mystery of the Thousand Moons. Mm-hmm. So whatever's up with that. They yeah. seem to, they seem to, Netflix seems to have um, a few, a few differences in verbiage. That's going to be the direct fault of whoever submitted all the metadata to Netflix. Interesting. Having had to deal with this myself, you have to really check everything uh, before you submit things off. Uh, I've never submitted something directly to Netflix, Mm -hmm. but I have had to submit things to be packaged for someone else to submit to netflix yes is your guys stuff on netflix it was for a second and it's not anymore uh for a while not anymore no we got the rights back to the the stuff that we did do you want to th- throw away uh, any plugs out there or uh yeah, the yeah. last thing we worked on was a little documentary called prosperity is what i spent the last like two years of my life uh diving into amongst plenty of other things which is around uh i believe if you just look up my name on imdb these things do come up so i think the other one will be uh origins was the prior one on uh I, that's the one i did submit to somebody i had to work on packaging like the video content and then i had to make sure it was like a f- crazy clusterfuck because even like the container I put it in in terms of like the compression and all that it had every everything had to be uh in the right uh video format in the right video container and even weird issues like the documentary we worked on had a lot of like stock footage in it right so that stock footage is being shot by someone else we're not in control of it but sometimes we get stock footage that um we just like overall but then you know our movies being shot at uh the official one is like what 23.97 frames per second it's in the digital format instead of like filmic is 24 solid right right um but it's like 23 drop frames whatever you want to call it uh is that what drop frame stock- means because yeah. it's like it's like a you're dropping that that fraction. last fraction. Gotcha. Yeah, you're dropping that last fraction. Um, there's there's a few ways to apply the term drop frame. You'll I'll explain in a hot second here where some of the stock footage we were taking in was 30 frames a second. Mm-hmm. So you know from our end, we just plop that into the timeline of the thing we were editing, and we were using Adobe Premiere Pro and. Usually Premiere will just handle it and then figure out the algorithms to make 30 frames fit into 24. Some does it cut way. like every sixth frame or something like that? No, it does. Again, it. This is the other way you can like. I I might be getting it wrong. Somebody like super technical is probably like yelling at me through whatever they're listening the, to us on. But there is something about it kind of. Um, uh, dropping and merging frames together gotcha or something like that that kind of can cause a problem sometimes like that's why you really don't want to do that when possible because when i de- uh delivered said film to whoever was taking it and handling it from there they literally came back with specific screenshots of the movie and said hey these shots won't work because there's screen tearing like the in- there's interlacing issues mm-hmm. 
that were showing up and they were like, hey, like Netflix is going to de- deny this right off the bat because it doesn't work or whatever. And I'm like, what the fuck are you talking about? I, I've seen a documentary that was shot on fucking mini DVs. Mm-hmm. Right. And there was fucking screen tearing going on all over the fucking place because it was somebody shot it themselves and it made it to Netflix and it became a, you know, minor viral Netflix sensation. Right. Right. Um, it's it, the one I'm thinking of specifically is a documentary called Dear Zachary. Um, huh. So which I don't know if it's still on there. I saw that movie like five years ago. Um, but anyways. So, but, but whoever we were working with was very, uh, I mean, to be fair, they they were, they wanted everything to be very clean, very presentable, but pretty much everything, like I had to give them the description of the movie. I had to give them alternate descriptions. I had to give them one line descriptions, uh, that didn't exceed a certain character limit, um, which, um, my boss is not good at being efficient with copy brevity yes let's put it that way (laughs) where sometimes i'll tell them like hey what description do you want to put in the bottom line of your bio you get like 25 characters he literally came back with like four sentences i was like 25 characters (sighs) not words characters let's go 25 Hmm. And then he was like, well, can you put, like, doctor of blah, 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 graduate of blah, 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 um, uh, four words. Let's just make this simple. Give me four words to describe you, (laughs) right? (laughs) And he goes, oh, fuck. (laughs) Like, great, that'll work. That'll work. Sending that off. Oh, fuck. That'll work. Oh, fuck. Um, Clever. So... Yeah, what's been fun lately is the uh, the uh, limits on social media that he also does not understand. Where I'm like seven seconds, you have you have seven seconds to say a thing. Is that what's okay. seven? What's seven seconds? Uh, that that one is um, Instagram stories. I don't know if it's seven exactly. It's somewhere in that realm. Okay, you know, so that's that's always been fun. Or just even the sixty second limit of Instagram videos in general, which yeah. is you know, yeah, yeah. He I'm- usually records videos that are like 20 minutes long yeah clearly we i mean i we aren't good with brevity either but yeah you know we're we're in a different format so yeah yeah Uh, Yeah. you know this isn't the show of being brief this is the show (laughs) of taking our time diving diving deep and picking shit apart picking shit apart and talking about stuff and being nitpicky and yeah and orally praising some other things and (laughs) yes uh, so this is exactly uh, where it, whoever is handling the copy that's being handed off to Netflix. That's so either it got passed to somebody who just was typing too quickly, as they were like, "Oh, mystery of a thousand moons, mystery of," and then they typed and uh, some, what's like, what's the name of this from, episode again? Mi- uh, yeah. Mystery of the thousand moons. Oh, mystery of the thousand moons. Got it. Right. Clack 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 clack. Yep. Moving on to the next one. Right. Next. So. Yeah, because it's even even the uh, the graphics that they get mm-hmm. that come up. Um, I don't know if you've noticed, but sometimes the even the thumbnail that appears in your list if you go through Netflix for the same program can alternate hmm. depending on previous things you have seen because there will be algorithms that will suspect that a maybe you'll watch arrested development if they show you the picture of michael Sarah because we just noticed you watched like 10 michael Sarah shows and movies in a row but if you like end up watching ozarks with jason bateman then they'll show you arrested development also starring jason bateman so what you're saying is that we should get a picture of michael Sarah and jason bateman and put that as our icon on iTunes, and then people yes, if we want to draw, will yeah, listen to the show. That's the goal. Yeah, no, no, no. Okay, I mean, Let's, no, 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 we're we're approaching it the wrong way. Clearly, it's uh, we need to get uh, <laughs> Margot Robbie singing in a bathtub from uh, The Big Short. Oh, That's okay. We're gonna clearly. we're gonna start this episode over again. Uh, one, <laughs> two, three go 
Welcome back, everybody, to the Something Edge you're looking for. This is Margaret Robbie <laughs> sitting in a bathtub here with <laughs> Lorenzo. I cannot do accents to save my life. I'm not even gonna make that attempt. <laughs> I, I think we're can good. I, I think we're good. Can I bring up my uh, my really quickly, just because she brought up this has nothing to do with anything other than Margot Robbie. You brought up my, Margot Robbie. I did not. Well, because I yeah, because I brought up Margot Robbie. I have a running theory that Margot Robbie is just a Jamie Presley, who somehow time jumped twelve years into the past. Okay, and she needs to pretend to be somebody else Until as to not affect up. her own timeline. Oh, I thought you were going to say like, until she can like catch up to herself again. No. Yeah. Because Jamie Presley is still around, but to me, they look a pretty much like the exact same person. Okay. So <laughs> I can tell them apart, but to me, they look so similar that, I really just think Jamie Presley accidentally time warped herself backwards and then throws on the Australian accent just to throw everybody off and be like, look, see, I'm not the same person. I'm not Jamie Presley. That's, not at all. That's I take that as fact. Yep. So that's that's what I got. Take a do do the Google image search. Take a look at both of them. I will do that. They are the same person. I Anyways. Will do that. We are like 15 minutes into this sucker, and we have not gotten to the fortune cookie yet. Shall we begin? I have one other thing before we get there. Oh, hit hit it up. Hit it up. So, Blue Shadow Virus had 2.94 million viewers. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Mystery of the Thousand Moons had 2.11 million. So, ostensibly, across a commercial break, 830,000 people tuned out. Yep, that's not good. (laughs) <laughs> Does that mean that people didn't like Blue Shadow Virus, or is it? Do you think it's a time frame thing, or is it just coincidence? I don't. I don't know it's, how those two things correlate as far as other, um, other shows that have been like double, uh, double release. I'm looking at for Clone Wars specific, or just across Clone television Wars shows specific. in general. Yeah, I mean, we'll have. To, uh, there's going to be a lot more that we'll need to look at. Like, there's going to be other context that we need, right? So, what day of the week was it? What time did the first episode air? What time did the second episode air? Mm-hmm. I think basically they aired on the same day of the week, which no, I no, but think I mean, was like Thursday or Friday. But so what I'm saying is. So if it airs on Thursday, were they also competing with, say, what was on 2009? Like, uh, uh, reruns Community of Seinfeld? And, I don't know. Yeah. You know what I'm saying, though? Like, right. What other TV event was happening? You know, if, if it was 8.30 and then a 9 o'clock airtime, like, is 9 o'clock bedtime for a lot of children, a lot of households? For 830,000 of them, I guess. Yeah. For, like if it's a nine and then nine thirty is like shit. These kids need to be in bed by ten. Right. Kids, go brush your fucking teeth. Right. Like I get that there's a second episode, but no, you got to be in bed by ten. Right. Which even now, now that I'm saying it loud, like that sounds really late for a like seven year old. Right. Like, it is. So, uh, I don't have children. You do. So yeah, yeah. But you but you get what I'm saying. Like so, that's where a drop off of this magnitude could come from. Yeah, and I am looking back and and in the in the order that we are doing things. This has only happened one other time, and is it is with the series premiere, ambush, and rising malevolence mm-hmm. were both released on uh, October third, two thousand eight, and. Mm-hmm. Ambush had 3.99 million, and then Rising Malevolence had 4.92. So it went up up almost a mm-hmm. million between uh, the first episode and the rising second episode. And, 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 and rising, yeah. right? And I can I can totally see that by way of not you know maybe some people missed the first one and or heard from somebody else like hey you need to check the show out. Like, there's another one coming on. Like, get off your or, ass. Yeah, or just like, 
if it's the first episode that's airing on actual television too sometimes especially in that era bef- it's it's before dvr became commonplace i would say like it, it was a thing mm-hmm. right but i think at that point like the ratings still weren't even counting that you know i think right. these are ratings for like actual people turning on sitting down watching every single commercial that was coming up or you know like the television was on during them you know right um and it's household it's not like per tv so if i have like 15 tvs and i'm watching it on all 15 oh TVs, yeah exactly unless yeah, i have yeah, like 15 different cable accounts i guess mm-hmm. so Which i don't even have the, one cable account so i definitely yeah. don't have 15 yeah so i'm gonna suspect that it's something to the effect that you're saying where it's like oh i forgot this was on and then we're tuning in right because also like they're kind right. of averaging viewers too so maybe maybe even during ambush you know there was a uptick of maybe from if it's an eight o'clock show between eight and eight thirty there's there's going to be disparity there but they kind of do the averaged out number mm-hmm. yeah right. i don't really know how ratings work i don't even know how they know what fucking channel i'm watching on my tv which is kind of creepy um, it's all Nielsen's still. It's it's not every not every television is, is or to some degree. Uh, again, if if you're watching over the air, obviously there's no way to quite track that. A right, lot of but it's, there are uh, still, um, at least in the past, you know, open air broadcasting, they were still able to figure out how many how many viewers there were, and I don't know how that works. It was like Nielsen surveys and such. So they'll they'll do like a mass survey that they kind of. Right. To represent like a a common populace of of the overall Mm -hmm. population. And then they just extrapolate that out. Something like that. Yeah. Right. So, yeah. So, but nowadays it's like, you know, Comcast has a good idea of like what channel you're tuned into direct TV. And then Nielsen still has its, um, they they have select uh subscribers that have um a box that is physically hooked up to right. the television it's like a cable yeah. box but different yes yeah it's only keeping track of what you are in fact tuned into so anyways yeah yeah so on okay. on to the fortune cookie a yes. single <laughs> chance is a galaxy of hope yeah uh, we're we're on a theme between these two episodes, between this one and the uh, Blue Shadow Virus. So. Hope, hope and hope. And last week I picked uh, Jen Urso as the author of of that fortune cookie, and this week I've got down Padme. I can see that. Yeah. So I I would still stick with Jen Urso just because of the the theming is so close, right? Okay. To to me, to me these two, they're in the same family. I get that they're saying something slightly different but to me it's 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 the same messaging through different words yeah the reason that i picked padme this week as opposed to jen urso is that uh jen seems a little more down to earth and this like galactic scale of hope seems more Mm -hmm. more ambitious uh more something that that would come from padme but i'm i'm good with with giving it to jen urso so we'll just keep her keep her on the docket for two weeks in a row and good for her. Um, yeah. So what do we have going on this episode, actually? Yeah, our newsreel is essentially a previously on and just kind of a setup for what's going on. So this this takes place immediately after uh, what we left last week with Obi-Wan mm-hmm. and Annie um, loading up, loading up Dr. Vindy. Dr. Vindy. And mm-hmm. uh, they've got a a little conversation going on back and forth uh, about uh, essentially what happened in the last episode. And Annie's, you know, like, oh, that was so close. Like, if that virus would have gone out, all of Naboo would be dead, essentially. Mm-hmm. And Obi-Wan's all suave Obi-Wan, like, you know, oh, you know, it's just another day in the, another day at the <laughs> office of yep. Saving the Galaxy Incorporated. Yeah. Uh, so, and he calls Doctor Vindy a slamo. He's like, "Let's get him back to Thede, and then we can actually get all this, the rest of this shit wrapped up." Um, mm-hmm. So we do 
clear we do definitively this episode have a an a plot b plot and the a plot follows annie and obi-wan and b plot follows uh the rest of the crew padme padme ahsoka Ahsoka, rex Rex, Mm -hmm. the rest of the clones other clones jar jar yep so um we cut back to plot B, and we got some clones coming into what I called the blue plant room, which, mm-hmm. are these blue plants, like, is this where the blue shadow virus was derived from? Because... I don't I don't know, because that doesn't make any sense, because it's a virus, it, and a plant is something completely different. Yeah, so there was some it, type of genetic testing, maybe these plants were being tested on, I don't, I don't know, there are some blue yeah. plants in there. And this yeah, is the room. Plan. This is the room where Padme uh, caught the rabbit droid and got the bomb, and then the bomb mm-hmm. was diffused. And then yep. uh, one of the bomber or bomb diffusing um, clones picks up the bomb, and he's like, "Hey, Senator, check it out." And there's a little hole where the vial goes in, mm-hmm. and it's empty. Yep. And so then everybody's like, "Ah, oh, fuck!" Like one of the droids took it. So then they. Plot A, uh, that's plot B. Plot B go is the chase to find the droid who took the vial. Mm-hmm. We'll find out what plot A is shortly. Um, an alarm goes off. There's this nice touch of these two clones like walking down the hallway discussing like, hey, how could this happen? Like, how did a droid get the virus and get out of here? And they totally just walk past the little rabbit droid that has the fucking mm-hmm. thing. Um, which, to me, is reminiscent of, from this time point, something that happened in the past and something that happened in the future, where in Star Wars A New Hope... Uh, with a little influence from the Force, Obi-Wan sneaks past a couple of stormtroopers that just kind of walk past him, even though he's, like, mm-hmm. right there. He's ha- hiding behind, you know, like a door frame. Yeah, exactly. And then I think something similar happens in The Force Awakens, right? Or Which my, scene? I'm trying, trying to think. I'm not sure. In some one scene at some point like in time. Like when Rey is sneaking probably. around. Probably. When yeah, right. Ray is sneaking around because then like, when Finn and Solo are sneaking around, they run right into Phasma. Right. Um. So you, you're probably thinking of Ray at some point. That's so, probably. Yeah, when she escapes and uh knocks out the storm uh, stormtrooper 007, right? Right. So yep. something like that. Yeah. Yep. Knocks out Daniel Craig. Yep. <laughs> So then these two clones go into uh, the room with all the bombs in them. Mm -hmm. And they start checking all of those. And I thought that they had, like, taken... They took all of the vials out, right? It looks like that, That's Well, that's what one of the things that either Padme or one of the clones said... I think one of the clones says that, like, when they walk in the room, like, oh, we already took all the vials out of these. And the other one's like, yep, I guess we'll have to double check. But they're not checking for ones that used to be empty and now are full. They're checking mm-hmm. for ones that were full, should be full, but are now empty. Yeah. So I'm not real sure why they're doing what they're doing there. And I, th- I think the whole reason is to get them into that room so that something mm-hmm. later can happen. Uh, we cut back to Anakin, Obi-Wan, and Vindy. Somehow, Vindy knows that, like, one vial of virus survived, and he starts, like, laughing, and he's full of exultation. He's like, yes, the virus has survived, and he's, like, going on. And Anakin and Obi-Wan kind of give him a look, like, what the fuck? Yeah, and then you hear about. an explosion, but what happens is the the rabbit, as I call him, walks mm-hmm. back into the bomb room and sticks it in one of the bombs and just like sets it off. Like boom, hits yeah. the button, boom, literal boom, boom, big boom, shakes shakes the ground. At this point, everybody knows what's going on. An alarm goes off. 
we got some clones that are like hauling ass down a hallway. Like mm-hmm. Rex is with them. Get to the safe room. Get to the safe room. As they're running down this hallway, there's doors just shutting right and left, right and left, right and left as mm-hmm. as they run. So why can't they just boogie through one of those doors before it closes? Uh, it seems like from so from what I'm seeing visually, they're not fast enough for it. The doors are definitely because the, the the shot angle is showing their feet mm-hmm. and the bottom of each door. Yes. So then, and they're closing you see before the they door. get there. Yes. So they can't hop in any of these rooms. But they could have... There's like a door, like every 15 feet, 20 feet, we'll say. It's Mm -hmm. like they're running down a hallway in a school, right? Yeah, yeah. But they never... like They were always going to the very end of the hallway. There was never a quick duck in here. Yeah, that definitely seems like that. um, Because all these doors closing seem to be some type of safety measure to contain whatever's going on in the hallway yeah so here's my other question real quick yeah why don't the doors all shut at the same time why do they only shut as the clones are running past them yeah like how does the alarm system know what direction the said contamination or whatever reason there would need to be for a lockdown Mm -hmm. to be coming from that direction so say like on the Titanic when they hit the button to start closing the uh what are you calling them like the the bulkheads or whatever okay. to stop more water from flooding into the other compartments. Right. This is a conscious decision that somebody is making, right? Yeah, so somebody hits a button and all the doors together start shutting, right? Because mm, there's no gotcha. There There's no idea from the... I mean, yeah, it's a ship that went down in 1912. But it's not like anybody knows exactly where the threat is. So they're just like, hey, just shut everything. Right, everything is on lockdown. Yeah, just lock it all down so that there's no water moving from any compartment to the the next. Like, that's exactly what these safety features were meant to do, right? Right, and you're exactly correct. And at the same time, uh, they call it like a safety room. That's what they're... Heading towards. Yes. And these doors are closing very, very, very slowly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, if it's a safety room, either the doors should close immediately or... like Or give you the chance to get in before you, you get in the and final. then you close the door. Yeah, exactly. Because what happens is they get to the end of the hall and... Uh, the clones are like trying to get in and they try to wedge the door open with their blasters, which I thought was mm-hmm. a pretty cool trick. Yeah. It doesn't work. Cause like one of them just snaps in half. Just and snaps. Like, I thought it would have been kind of cool if that would have done some damage to the door. Uh, because Ahsoka holds the door open for all of them to get through. And then she like dives through. So yeah, via the force, via yeah. the force. And I think one of a couple things should have happened. Either this mm-hmm. blaster should have, when it snapped, done some damage to the door so that when mm-hmm. the doors do close, there's a leak and that's how the virus gets in. Yeah. Or Ahsoka should have kind of mirrored what Anakin did a few weeks ago with when the explosion's behind him, he just like pushes everybody through the blast door and then closes the blast door. And sacrifices himself. Yeah. That would I have been... agree. That's what I thought the entire time. I don't understand why she didn't turn around to hold off the incoming contamination. Right. That would have it worked. It was a really weird choice. That's probably the best option. Not using that option, I think option two with the blaster doing some damage to the door. So they think that they get in. Be, uh, because she dives through the doors and the doors close, but you see some of this blue smoke coming in. This is a good. Mm-hmm. This is a good time to talk about like the actual visualization of the virus. Yes, and it pours out like a blue smoke wave, just barreling through. Uh, mm-hmm. This underground. It's a blue land. wave. Yeah, basically. It's a blue... It's a blue shadow. Conscious, yeah, 
wave, it's basically reminiscent of a less sentient version of John Carpenter's The Fog. Mm-hmm. Right? So, uh, going back really quick, I do have one question. So, sure. the the robot, ra- the rabbit robot mm-hmm. puts the vial in one of the bombs that was in that big bomb room mm-hmm. and then detonates it there, right? Mm-hmm. Just reestablishing those facts? Yes. The clones physically snipped all the uh, detonators on the bombs themselves, right? We thought so, but what if they didn't? What if they just pulled all of the vials out? Okay. Which also leads to the question of, if so, why didn't they just do that to the other one? But maybe they were like, oh, fuck, where's the vial? Where's the vial? Because the vial goes in like one of the nubbies. Yeah, that is sticking off of the bumbler, mm-hmm. which is what that toy is called that I was talking about <laughs> last week. Yes, yeah. So you can look up bumbler toy 1990s and you will see a picture. <laughs> it should be a green ball with uh, many or a few multicolored so like, um, yeah, nubs that stick spiky off things, and it kind of vibrated and tumbled around on the floor, and it was supposed to entertain your your small children. Yeah. Uh, so maybe they or couldn't scare your dogs. Yes. So maybe they couldn't find that, but they saw some wires, and then they cut the wire instead. Okay. Yeah. So uh, they just do want to reestablish and question that one before we move too far away. When you think about those two circumstances, they don't seem to line up because mm-hmm. I didn't even think about it until you just said something. Yeah. And right before you said something, I was like, "Oh shit!" Like. So he blew that one up, so then all of the other bombs should blow up also. Yeah. But that's not what happened. Because there should be... Yeah, if, if there's a bomb... <sighs> Even yeah, if I there's just don't no detonator, work... they should still blow up. Yeah, you, you know, you, you throw a bunch of firecrackers into a fire pit, they're all just going to go off, right? Right, this is why you're not so, supposed to throw, like, old cans of spray paint in your trash fire that you have in your backyard. Exactly. So, I, yeah, none of that makes sense to me. Either there's a physical explosion that fucks up that entire compound, which, again, still makes no sense to me. Well, there was a mighty large explosion because it uh, it rocked the the bedrock, we'll say. I'd say yes. the earth, but it's not. It rocked the Naboo. Is that how that works? I guess. Maybe. Yeah, it, it rocked the planet. It rocked the planet. It did. It did rock at least part of the planet. So, but yeah, I mean, that's a, that's, that's a valid question that I don't have an answer to. Yeah. So, all right. Just, I feel like this, on from there. we may bring up more questions than we have answers to here. Um, yeah. So, so, Anakin calls, Anakin doesn't call Ahsoka. What I wrote was Anakin pulls an Ahsoka gun ray on Vindy. Yes. Yeah. Which uh, starts threatening. Yeah, it makes yeah. me smile because this is obviously where Ahsoka learned it from. Oh, yeah. And yeah. that where I'm talking back to... Uh, what was that episode? Cloak of Darkness. Where... Mm-hmm. Luminara Unduli and Ahsoka had Gunray prisoner, mm-hmm. and immediately Ahsoka just like pulls a lightsaber on him and sticks it up to his throat. This is exactly what Anakin is doing to Vindy right now. The only difference is yeah. that Vindy doesn't care if he dies because like he's yeah. done his job. Um, yeah, and he only cares about the virus. He only cares about the virus. So Annie and Obi Wan are trying to get an antidote. Like, you know, where's yeah. the antidote, where's the antidote, and Vindy is insistent that uh, there isn't one, and that even if there was one, he wouldn't tell them. So, Obi-Wan convinces Annie, we need to get him, just put him on the fucking ship, like, we'll take him back to Theed. And it's interesting, because he says, we'll take him back to the capital. So, I was mm-hmm. thinking, Coruscant, but it's not Coruscant, they go to no. Theed. Um, yeah. I agree, I thought they were going to go to the Senate. As a whole, but I guess they're going to the Senate body of just Naboo itself or something. They're just going to the capital of Naboo, which is Theed. Yeah. Yeah. 
So, uh, Obi Wan says there's more than one way to skin a womp rat, which you gotta you gotta throw in those womp rat references where you can. Yeah. And Vindy's response is just essentially like Nabu is doomed. Mm-hmm. All like he's happy with at least the one planet. Going oh, he's down. super. He's super pleased. Yeah. So he so, must have like family somewhere else that is getting uh, well compensated for his demise or something. I think he's just that mad scientist that cares about. He thinks the he's going to go like of, go down in history as like the guy that yeah. brought back the the BSV, the, the blue shadow virus. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I th- that was my only reasoning for him there. Uh, there is another point that gets made right before that where we uh, see a scene with Padme. And uh, she does talk to Anakin, I believe, and she's concerned about droids trying to make their way out, which would release the contamination, which is currently enclosed in the bunker itself. Mm -hmm. Right? That's just prior to that scene, I think. Yep. Um, And then that's why, like, the, the Padme connection is kind of what is setting Anakin off in this episode. Yeah, but Padme uh, and Jar Jar are in like their protective suits again. Yeah. So they're yeah, good. they're in Yeah, they're fine. They're 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 in the the what is it? Like the C something yeah, I forgot what the suits are called, but anyways, they're in hazmats. Yep. Uh hazmat suits. Yeah, and then after the scene, uh, as they're trying to find the antidote, or they're, they're, uh, Anakin's threatening Vindy for the antidote, Ahsoka and Rex uh, come to the full realization that some of the BSV did get in, and they are, in fact, uh, contaminated. Yeah, because there's like a computer in there, and one of the, one of the clones is looking at it, and uh, the Arbesh on it says something to the effect of contaminants detected or something like that. Mm-hmm. I don't know exactly what it is, but it is something similar to that. So yeah. Um, but either way, they they know they're contaminated. Uh, then we quickly cut over to uh, Anakin and Obi Wan uh, showing up at the Capitol, and Typho is there to greet them. Yes. Yes, I do want to um, to add one thing to what you were talking about when you said that that. Ahsoka and Rex realize that essentially they're fucked um, because Mm. the BSV got in and Rex says we may be dead men but we could still stop the droids so he's still thinking of his primary objective which is to keep this thing this virus from spreading further and doing this is initially it was stop the doctor stop the stop the bombs and they tried mm-hmm. to do that. Bomb went off, so then there's virus spread. So now he's like, okay, we need to contain, put this on lockdown. Yeah. And to do that, we need to go and destroy or to stop all these droids because they think that a droid took one vial and is trying to escape. Um, mm-hmm. That being and they're only, said. They're, they're even just concerned that the fact that it's spread around the base, that even if you just open one of the hatches, then the virus is out. Is all, yeah. Right, possibly. Uh huh. We, we'll come back to that later. Remind yeah, me of that. That was, that, was, that was my understanding on the concern Padme was raising in the scenes prior. Oh, it's totally. That, it's totally the yeah. concern. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, anyways. Uh, I do. Now I have a question for you. Okay. You said in the last episode when we were talking about Vindy and Dirt that uh, in their grand oration of their plans to to the droids, like the droids don't need motivation, they need directive. Mm-hmm. So why are they even trying to escape? Wouldn't they just continue to patrol the hallways indefinitely? I- Agree. I also had that thought of why the droids wanted out. Mm-hmm. Um, in this universe, there does seem to be some robo sentience, right? Is that. Yeah, it's not is quite. Word? It is. Yeah. It might yeah. be. Should be. Yeah. So we, we got the biggest. Uh, View of this in Solo, by far. Right, with L3. Uh, 
with L3 uh, causing a robo revolution, as I will refer to it as. Yeah. Um, a droid uprising. I like the to call droid it. uprising, uh, where the the one droid is literally just standing on another computer, just stomping away. I don't which remember is, that part. It's one quick shot, and that was the shot that really sold that whole scene to me. Uh, which this isn't the solo episode, but now that I'm thinking about it, it's kind of weird that a robot is standing on a computer and just stomping away because that would just be like me standing on another person just going like, yeah, fuck this shit. I'm like pretty sure I saw you do that last year. At... Oh, just like stomping people down to get yeah. into the room. Oh yeah. Yeah. That oh, happened. Yeah. My elbows are strong. I will knock a fucker down. So <laughs> Lorenzo's elbows are so strong he can stomp with his elbows. It's amazing. Oh, yeah. Um, but yeah. So yeah. So the, were, yeah. I, yeah. I don't know why the droids have the self-directed initiative to try and get the fuck out of there. Yeah, it's bizarre. I feel like this is the first time that we've seen it in the Clone Wars, and I guess we'll have to look out for it in the future. Because. Uh, I mean, we've seen the droids running in fear and stuff like that, right? Is that is that different to you, or? I guess I didn't, I, yes. I guess that I hadn't made that connection in the past. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm more used to, like, 3PO. Well, I guess 3PO has a sense of self-preservation. Yes, absolutely. But... These droids, uh, in their mind, like there's the virus isn't going to do damage. Maybe, maybe part of their programming is if virus is released, make sure it gets out to the planet. Mm-hmm. Maybe that's what like it is. Spread maybe it's like a, well. you know, like uh, like beta programming or like secondary level of of mm-hmm. order of operation or whatever. Yeah. Uh, spread spread all this shit out, yeah. Right, I guess that makes sense. Like primary directive, secondary, tertiary, and, and so on. Mm-hmm. So it's somewhere down mm-hmm. the list of objectives, but not that high was, yeah, on the priority. They, so it's not like the first thing that they do, because otherwise they'd yeah. just be trying to tear the base apart all the time. But nonetheless, there's nothing about this episode that makes that clear. Like, we are making that jump ourselves. There's nothing that's given away that... Correct makes this clear in in any manner correct Uh, so the next note that i have is yes lorenzo this is the same hangar um and i gather that based on the approach to the city of feed yes and the view out of the hangar so i I do believe that this is one and the same the hangar from the phantom menace so darth maul did briefly walk the floor of this hangar Yeah, Uh, which I don't think I noticed in the prior episode, but for whatever reason I noticed in this one, I just want to bring up the art style as they were making their approach into as far as like the the background goes, like the the scenery. Not even the background. It's the as they were approaching the Capitol building. Uh It's that it's a very similar shot to what we saw in episode one. Correct, but. So you see the waterfalls coming down, and I saw it in the last episode, but in this episode, for whatever reason, the art style for just that one shot as they're making the approach in, Mm -hmm. the building itself, the landscapes, and everything in the wide shot, Mm -hmm. other than ship coming in, had a full paintbrush style to it. Absolutely. Right? I You saying this reminds me that I had notes on it for last week. So it was there in the last episode. It was. Okay. Because I saw the waterfalls and stuff, but for whatever reason, I missed the art brush style Mm -hmm. that it had laid down. So I I found it very... It was out of context as a still frame. I thought it was aesthetically pleasing. I, I think it's aesthetically pleasing, too. I think that it does kind of fall in line with some of the other things that we see because... uh. When you see close-ups of, like, the clone armor and stuff, mm-hmm. sometimes it, it does look like it's brush-painted. When, really? When 
in universe reality, it should be either smooth or like battle damaged. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a stylistic choice for the texturing of objects where often even smooth textures are kind of um, brush fuzzed, however you want to say that. But yeah. it's usually not, a, it usually doesn't stand out as much as this this large, wide landscape establishing zoom in shot, yeah. landing shot that we had in this episode and in last episode. Yep, for for whatever reason, it to me it because I haven't noticed that with the clone armor, I the battle damage is what I might notice the most, but in terms of especially on the character designs of like Ahsoka, Anakin, Obi Wan, especially the the more humanoid characters, you know, outside of suits and such i feel like you can they, even see it on like either ahsoka's face or shock t's face at some point in time. I, i'll have to find I i'll have to find some like, evidence of this and send it to you and yeah. uh i won't i won't uh spend more time trying to convince you of it without visual evidence yes well uh, all i want to get out is that the characters are definitely meant to look like wood block Character, like physical characters of some sort, right? right. There's a, there's a fate the the a physical presence to them, right? So it really betrays the style to me to have a wide establishing shot that is clearly meant to be like a flat two D hand brushed like Bob Ross style oil painting. Okay, uh, question slash justification. Mm-hmm. Were this to have been a live action scene in a Star Wars movie that was produced in the late seventies, early eighties, this would have been done by matte painting. Is yes. this supposed to be reminiscent and or invoke the feel of matte painting, but have just one less layer of um refinement? I I had that sort of justification as well too but then the matte painting still has to match the realism of everything else that's going on i agree with you right so it's the matte painting is supposed to be in service of the story as a whole not stand out as its own piece of art right i just saw either today or yesterday like a list of 11 matte paintings in star wars Mm -hmm. and I will say a few of them surprised me. Yeah. I do not have specific ex- examples, nor do I probably. It's going to be like backgrounds in Bespin, probably a few shots on Hoth, potentially. So Bes- Bespin is one of them. When they land on the landing platform in Bespin and they walk out of the Millennium Falcon and down, Cloud City. The, yeah. down the ramp toward the city, the mm-hmm. only thing that is a set is that rampway yep everything around it including the millennium falcon is not there it's part of the matte painting right it's part of the matte painting yeah um at the end of a new hope the metal scene when they walk Mm -hmm. down the rank and file Mm -hmm. it's like 50 50 yes most of most of the people in attendance are mm-hmm. matte painting and then it's it's nice the way they do it because like it's like one section of actual people one section of painting one section of apple, actual people one section of painting mm-hmm. uh, yeah yeah there was a couple yeah. that i was like yeah i totally knew that i could totally tell yeah but it made me smile anyway yeah matte painting's a uh an art that ralph is... mccory is the shit and i know that he's yeah. not the only only one but oh, yeah. uh yeah. I mean, yeah there there are some movies where i think the matte painting definitely is more obvious nowadays ghostbusters has a lot of matte paintings mm-hmm. um but I indiana mean, jones does some um, indiana jones has a lot uh citizen kane i think has some really good uses of matte painting mm-hmm. because uh the 
the uh, speech scene where he's making a speech to the big audience. There's the wide shot with people. Okay. They poked holes in the audience, and then they moved a light behind it to m- to make it look like there was movement in the audience, mm-hmm. which I think is fucking brilliant for being 1937. It is brilliant. 19, 1941? 1937? 37. I'm going to 37 with that one. Anyways. Yeah. So, I regarding this, it, no, it does it. You don't think that's it, supposed to be a callback or anything? It's just... N- a stylistic yeah, they, choice for for that particular uh, visual. I'm not going to lie. I honestly just think it was a budget thing. I think they ran out of actual physical time. Okay. To do I thing. saw it and I was like, man, that's beautiful. And like I was hung up on the beauty of the artwork and I was okay uh-huh. with having this, this ship fly into that. I was totally no, okay I, with it. I was very... I... It was pretty, and then it really threw me for a loop. Okay. Right. So that that's where I stand with that one. Yeah. I, Anyways. I can understand that. Uh, yeah. So when Omi and Annie do get through the wonders of Bob Ross back to the yeah. the hangar from The Phantom Menace, Typho greets them, and mm-hmm. essentially, instantly, he has a cure to the problem. Yep. He has found an antidote. Or at least he is taking credit for having found an antidote. And yeah. I don't really know why, one, why was he looking for an antidote? Did he hear the explosion also? And if so, like, he found it pretty quickly. What is he using? Is he using Google? Did he look it up on Wikipedia? Uh, because he's, when he's talking about it, he's just kind of around the decapitated droid head table. Uh, mm-hmm. So it's yeah, not as though he's that at circular platform thingy, right? It's not as though he's at uh, some computer terminal or anything like mm-hmm. that. He's they just like walk up to the table and he's like, "I got your answer." Yeah, here uh, it is. And like the the hologram even like pops up like a facsimile of of the Rixa root, the Rixa root, yeah. which is what and it's it is. found only on Diego. He brings up except correct? yes, except for it's not. Because there is a second uh, location where it is found in canon, which is Tuan Kiti, mm-hmm. uh, is the name of the place. Where's uh, where's that information, or like, where is it uh come up in canon? It comes up in Darth Maul Part One, which is a um, which is a comic, comic? book. Yeah, the comic. Of course, it does. <laughs> so and on so the story of Tuan Kiti is apparently where a certain Han Solo and Chewbacca went to find some rat tars. Ah, okay. So there's there's kind of a few double double links in here, nice. um, but. Wikipedia essentially says at the time of the Clone Wars, it is believed that the only place that you could find this was on. On Iego? Iego. So um, here's my other question, too. Sure. Is in the previous episode, they mentioned that the blue shadow virus was completely eradicated? Yes. So there has to have been a known antidote slash vaccine to eradicate said virus, correct? And I'm guessing that it was from this Reeksa root, and maybe that's what uh, Typho looked up. So it just wasn't... Yeah. It's just not... I mean, there's... like it's we not talk, common knowledge anymore, but... Well, like we talked about before, um, what what's, what's the cure to smallpox? Like, smallpox is essentially gone, but you and I don't know... Like, if smallpox popped up, it's not like we could be like, okay, we need to go and get this and this and this, and we'll do mm-hmm. this shit, and we'll we'll be good. We'd be like, yeah. fuck! There's, there's fucking yeah. smallpox. Like, fuck! So that's why I'm fine with uh, Anakin and Obi-Wan freaking out the way they did. Okay. But this also, to me, explains why Typho was able to find it as quickly as he did. Yeah, you bringing that up 
talks me into uh, understanding all of that. And that's yeah. not something that I thought about during the episode, but um, uh-huh. that's, you know, part of why we do this stuff is so that we can yeah. talk through these things and make sense sure. out of some things and make less sense out of others. Yeah, like, I'm sure there's some archive that's like, oh, yeah, like, no, it's 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 a reeks of root. Just go find the reeks of root, and, and we'll be good. Don't worry. Which Don't is, worry, guys. Which is exactly what Anakin wants to do. He's like, okay, let's go. We got to go. We got to go. We got to go. And mm. Obi-Wan, or... Uh, Typho's both Typho, yeah. Typho Typho's says like it's no, a suicide. Like yeah. you, you can't go because you'll never come back. Yeah. Like yeah, Number goes, one, it's it's deep in separatist uh territory, controlled mm-hmm. area, right? Yep. And that uh, yeah, like they'll never make it back alive because of that, essentially is what he's saying. Yeah. Also, like they don't really have a plan or anything. They're just the plan is yeah, go get Reeks of Root and come back, right? Right. Do you know where Yago is? No, but I'll be in the car. Like, let's go. Yeah. Like, we'll get the directions as we go. We have, yeah, but even just a starting point is, like, a direction to start heading is maybe a good idea, sir. Yeah. So, so uh, eventually, Anakin is just like, nope, we're going, and uh, we can we can do it. We can figure it out, and uh, Obi-Wan's going with me, and Obi-Wan basically says, yeah, I'll agree. Mm-hmm. I agree with yeah, that. Yeah, he's like, yeah, I mean, this this needs, I mean, it does need to happen, but maybe we should plan it. But if you're going, well, yeah, sure, we can go. That's fine. Great. We're going. At this point, we cut back to plot B, and uh, Ahsoka has since talked to Padme, and it's currently only Padme and Jar Jar that are in their hazmat suits. Mm-hmm. Uh but they they trek across over to wherever Ahsoka is. I think she calls it like the end of Complex B or something like that. Yeah. And uh, she opens the door, and you know everybody's contaminated. At this point, I was thinking like, okay, why are the clones getting fucked up? Because they got their helmets on, like they can survive in space with these things. Yeah. But then I also fast forwarded to. The Force Awakens, mm-hmm. where there's like the gas leak on the Falcon, yeah, that Ray fixes, and then that gets picked up by Han and Chewie's new giant shoebox ship. And Finn's suggestion is like break the thing you just fixed and dump the toxic gas into the Falcon because the the breather system on Stormtrooper helmets, he says they're built to filter smoke, not toxins. Yeah. So then at that point, I'm like, all right, cool. And it's, I feel weird bringing up things from uh, The Force Awakens because it's happened a handful of times, but that's something that was made seven years later. Mm-hmm. And it fits into the same idea that's going on in these stories. Is that good? Like, is that is that a good thing? Or I personally like it because, I mean, it, here's here's the problem with the the, the reasons. Uh, I'm trying to word this very carefully. Mm-hmm. So. Some people didn't like Last Jedi because it didn't do what they wanted it to do, and they had disagreements with where the story went. Is that a generally fair assessment? That is a that is an understood assessment of not only that movie but also the prequels. Yes, 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 yes. So now, now we're taking smaller nuggets out of force awakens per se Mm -hmm. and we are applying something that came seven years later with the idea that these filmmakers had some knowledge of these past well i'm not even i'm not even thinking that like i'm thinking that i i guess i'm just bringing up that it is interesting that there are parallels between uh, these stories that were written and produced in 2007, 2008, 2009, and so on, 
and later in a movie that came out in 2015, mm-hmm. right? And it all takes place in the same universe. So I'm not saying that J.J. Abrams like went and studied all of the Clone Wars and was like, ooh, I'm going to pick this thing and that thing, and I'm going to put it here, and I'm going to use this bit of dialogue to explain something that happened in a random episode of a cartoon you know, almost a decade ago. I just think mm-hmm. it's interesting that we can look at these things and be able to see parallels between this oh, stuff yeah, yeah. Be- yeah, because I- of the way that the story structure works in general for the Star Wars universe – when you do, it's logical, right? It's logical yes. that um, that the that stormtroopers are affected by toxin, mm-hmm. but they can they can utilize their self containment system in outer space. Yes. Yeah. So yeah. So then, what I'm basically gonna retrofit what i was starting to say is that there is some internal logic that some the that I, I think what disney did well was they put a story group in charge of things i've talked about uh-huh. my belief and faith in the story group before right right so there is some sort of internal logic that's happening and uh yeah so it's somebody's definitely paying attention to the universe and i think that's where some of the disagreements can happen on any sequel because anything beyond uh, even just a new hope right some people have disagreements on like where empire went where jedi went Mm -hmm. right and it's not exclusive to the star wars universe right so right like oh i loved I I was talking about it earlier, you know. I like Austin Powers one. I didn't like Austin Powers two, and then by Austin Powers three, I'm just like, fuck it. This is the direction they're going, right? Yeah, the same thing happened with the the Alien franchise and the Terminator Alien, franchise, Terminator, and, yep. and uh, X Men. Right? X Men. I'm not uh, a big MCU fan of like a whole. the new three X Men movies. Yeah. So it's just it's just one of those things where. Uh, Sometimes it's because the the writing gets stale, or sometimes it's because like the internal logic breaks, right? Mm-hmm. So, say with the big criticism of Episode One being the Midichlorians, right? It's because suddenly the internal logic of Star Wars gets new information that shifts everything that came prior, right? Right. So it's things it's, like those excite me. So like. Midichlorians, back mm-hmm. in 1999, I thought was a really, really cool concept. And I was just like, <laughs> this just opened a whole new world of fucking shit for me to look into. Uh-huh. So, to me, midichlorians, not like a, this, it's not the straw that broke the camel's back. It was, mm-hmm. it was the key to a lock to a door that I didn't even know existed. Yeah. Um, and that being said at the same time, uh, years down the line, George Lucas said essentially, well, uh, maybe, maybe Qui-Gon Jinn was just, you know, like, uh, like a, a fringe member of the, the <laughs> Jedi religion and came up with his, with his own ideas and views. And I don't know why I didn't just use my, my spot on Kermit George Lucas impression for all of that. But, <laughs> uh, and I think that's great too, mm-hmm. that it was Qui-Gon that had, you know, this idea of mini chlorines had been like floated around and it was Qui-Gon that like took it and ran with it. And, was fucking obsessed with it and like nope this is the deal like this is where the fucking force comes from this is how we're gonna find find the the so the prophecy the fulfiller of the prophecy and whatever so you know that that logic there does explain a lot about his character to me because then he is the you, you choose your flavor he's gonna be either the the super hippie of the group that uh 
takes a good idea and takes it too far. Right. right? Or he's the flat earther of the Jedi, right? <laughs> um, right. Like he's got this belief and he's going to stick to it whether there's fucking evidence or not. This is my thing to believe. That I'm seems like sticking there's with some it. evidence for it. So, For the midichlorians? Which, yeah, for the midichlorians. Yeah, yeah, he, he takes a blood test. I think test I was saying there's he, some evidence for the flat earth. Oh, yeah. I mean, there's all <laughs> evidence for the flat earth, dude. <laughs> there's endless evidence, clearly. So, but yeah, so he's he's the flat earther that takes, he's the flat earther hippie that takes one little nugget of an idea that is sound and then extrapolates nothing but nonsense from it. Right. Right. Have you ever tr- okay. tried to pour water on a ball that doesn't stick to the ball? <laughs> but pour water on a Frisbee? Oh, it boy. works. Yeah. I, I, I see it. Uh, tides go in, tides go out. Can't explain that. <laughs> Please tell me you understand that reference. I don't, but... Oh, my God. We'll talk about that later. That is me is making that, a fishy joke, that, but... Uh, is that Does that have to do with flat earth evidence? No, that's just uh, uh, Fox News nonsense. Uh, sorry to any listeners that are huge fans yeah. of Fox News. Yeah. Uh. But uh, Bill O'Reilly had a scientist on, and he was arguing that science can't explain everything, which is true. But Bill that's O'Reilly the... was arguing that science can't explain everything, or the science scientist was arguing? Bill O'Reilly was arguing that because science couldn't explain everything, therefore you can't depend on science when it does explain something. That was kind of the logic I was getting out of what he was saying. And that's ass backwards, but okay. But so the scientist was like, well, I mean, that's kind of the point. Like, we don't know everything, so we are doing what we can to get evidence to explain things. So then Bill O'Reilly, his super woke example of how science doesn't work is, well, tides go in, tides go out. You can't explain that. And literally everybody was like, yeah, yeah we can. can. We completely understand how tides work. What are you talking about? It's the sun and the moon interacting on the gravity of the earth that is enough to slosh the water on earth around. So then his next big thing was, well, then how'd the moon get there? You can't explain that. Yeah, yeah, was, yeah, we, yeah, was- yeah we can. There was yeah, a large can. planetary body like 4.2 that, billion years ago that smashed into the Earth. and com- yep, Yeah, exactly. And it, so, and it made many chlorians. Yes. And then you take a blood test, and that's how you figure out if you are yeah. uh, Jedi-worthy or Did not. Did anybody ever give the moon a blood test? No. Yeah, exactly. Nobody knows. Nobody because knows. Can't the, explain that. Because the Earth is flat. That's why nobody <laughs> gave the moon a blood test. Can't explain it. Can't explain it. I'm so stick- anyways. I'm, I'm going to stick to this. <laughs> I like that as we keep going in like our uh at least for me my I think by this point my political and world views are very extremely between this episode and the last episode where I brought up vaccines very quickly. Um, yeah. <laughs> I think I think my world views are becoming very clear. If you don't know who I am at this point as a human being, then uh yeah, I don't yeah, maybe I don't know myself as well as I thought, so well, we'll see. Yeah. Anyways, I'm gonna hop back to all this stuff though, and let's, let's uh, move on. Yeah. Breeze through some plot A, plot B stuff because, yeah, do it. as interesting as it is, I'm not gonna go shot by shot through all of it. But we've no, got Obi Wan and Anakin that head off to uh, Diego, and mm-hmm. when they get there, Obi Wan pronounces it I Ego. So this is another same place. Same name, different pronunciation, yeah. and I really feel I, th- I think this is. Uh, speaking of conspiracy theories and whatnot, I think this is actual evidence, continued evidence of the fact that when it is possible, different characters pronounce the same thing differently. Mm-hmm. To just to give it. Yeah, to justify or to give credence to what happened in the past. 
because I think in the past George Lucas didn't give a fuck if you said Leah or Leia or Han or mm-hmm. Han. So yeah. now it's like it's being thrown in maybe as an inside joke or maybe as a see like you can say things differently and it's fine. It's like, fine. It's fine. It's just the way people pronounce words. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Because what uh, uh, have I ever asked you this? What do you call Leia's ship at the beginning of A New Hope? You call it what we've. Uh, we've not spoken of it directly, but I know that you call it the Tantive, and I yeah. call it the Tantive. Yep. And so, there are there I've also go. heard Tantivi. Yeah. Uh, so, but yes. I, I yeah. I've noticed it, but I never brought it up. Yes, that I so, remember. Correct Tantive me, people out there, if I'm wrong. Hit me up on Tantive, Twitter yep. and say, "Hey, dipshit!" And you know, this episode, you did talk about it. Yeah, I'll have to find, because the evidence I have for Tantive is Pablo Hidalgo brought up a radio drama of Star Wars where it's pronounced Tantive, and then therefore that is what Pablo Hidalgo considered. Well, well how about this, Pablo Hidalgo? That is not canon. <laughs> yeah. And you should know that. It stuck around, but it so. stuck around. So, that yeah. And nobody else in the movies ever names the ship, right? So... Uh, yeah, it's I've never named on screen. That is, as, is very again true. as we discussed in the last episode. I I love it when things get named on screen directly. Just you do because that's you do that's good storytelling, folks. You do. <laughs> right? Tell anyways. Don't, tell don't show. Just yeah. Say carry it. on. So Iego, uh, Igor, Igor, uh, Frankenstein, Frankenstein. We are on Iego <laughs> and. Uh, uh, when they pull up, there's all kinds of fucking debris around this planet, yep. like hell of fucking debris. Yep. And it's I a know graveyard of ships. At, at some point in time, I think I have a note that says like "kudos to whoever animated this" because that's some hell of debris, and yeah, it looks nice. Uh, there was a lot. Diego of depth supposedly in has like it's like the Minnesota of of the Star Wars world, and instead of lakes, it's got ten thousand moons. Or a thousand yep. moons or whatever. So, Obi and Annie make it planet side. And they encounter this little boy named Jabo Hood. Uh, mm-hmm. And it's hilarious when they land because there's a sh- there's all these fucking battle droids. And Anakin's like, let's go, let's go, let's go. And Obi-Wan tries to chill him out and calm him down. He just runs out and starts slashing fucking droids down. Yeah, and Obi Obi just kind of slowly walks up behind him, and he's like, "Congratulations, you just killed seventeen defenseless droids." And yeah. then another one falls, and Anakin's like, eh, "Actually, 18. And either way, I'm down because I counted sixteen. Obi Wan got seventeen. Like this would have been sixteen if they were actually battle droids, and it would have gone nice. on my spreadsheet. So yep. he counts the same way that I do, but um." Yeah, they meet this kid, J. Bo Hood, who is essentially like an Anakin Skywalker, young Anakin Skywalker analog, uh, where mm-hmm. he's smart with droids, uh, except for this dude is the complete opposite of a slave, and he is just left free to do whatever the fuck he wants. Yeah, he's There's, a street rat, more so, like a, I don't know, like mm-hmm. urchin of some sort. Yeah, right. they're just kind of... Everybody on this planet is just kind of stuck because we... We learn that uh, there's this thing called Droll, uh, mm-hmm. which is a mythological ghost that is protecting the planet and at the same time cursing the planet. So you can come, yeah. you can come to Iego, but you can't leave. If you try to leave, uh, Droll is gonna get mad and and kill you. He's gonna blast so. you with his laser vision. Go ahead. Yeah. So Iego is the Hotel California of the Star Wars universe. <laughs> yes, possibly. <laughs> you can check in anytime you want, but you can never leave. <laughs> you can never <laughs> leave. Very so, much uh, so. <laughs> yeah, there's there's like a few names that are tossed around. Like Jabo says the system is haunted or cursed, whatever you want to call it. He I bo- says something to that effect. Yep. Nobody gets past droll. Some uh, some alien that looks like Davy Jones from 
uh, Pirates of the Pirates. Caribbean comes out and he gets all fucking mad and he's like yeah. talking about it's cursed, it's cursed, I tell you, it's fucking cursed. But I think yeah. he was just like drunk behind a uh like he literally pops out of nowhere, which is really really fucking weird. He's never named. Uh-huh. But if you look him up, he is Amit Noloff. So okay. A M I T N O L O F F. Um Okay. That's cool. Brings up the curse again, but uh we did skip over a little bit before that dude shows up. Uh, Anakin and Obi Wan do ask Jabo if he knows where to get some of this uh, Rixa root, and that's when Jabo is like, well, "Yeah, I mean, I can get your Rixa root, but it's not going to do you any good because you can't leave the fucking planet." Yeah, he says here, there, everywhere, whatever, and Anakin mm-hmm. gets all pissed and he's like, "I'm in a hurry," and he goes, "Not anymore. Like, what? Why you got to be in a hurry? You're not yeah, going anywhere. You're fucking stuck." Yeah. Um, so uh. There's a quick cut to plot B where uh, Padme and Ahsoka, Rex, Jar Jar all encounter a few droids. There's a nice little firefight that's going back and forth down a hallway. Mm-hmm. And Ahsoka does this like awesome move where uh, it's the... Uh, the uh, They're the droidicas, the rollies. Yeah, the droidicas. The, um, with the shields up and everything. Yeah, whatever you want to call them. Yeah, they got the shields up and then... Uh, Ahsoka, like, goes in and, like, pokes her saber through, like, a single point in the shield. Which... Yeah, so she does what um, what we were talking about with the Lerman when... Yes. When Rex, like, backs slowly through the shield mm-hmm. and Keep his, shooting the, away. the barrel of his blaster is still on the outside and still firing... So she's, mm-hmm. she does this in reverse where she just slowly sticks the end of her lightsaber down in mm-hmm. and then ignites it and kills yes. kills the... Takes out the droidica. Yeah. Yep. But while this is happening, Jar Jar, of course, is trying to help and then ends up inadvertently like shooting the same droidica, which kind of throws Ahsoka off. Okay. And then at the same time, Padme is like, wait, Jar Jar, don't. Like... She's fucking on it. Right. So she jumps in to try and stop Jar Jar from, you know, shooting Ahsoka in the fucking face. Uh-huh. Uh, and then during this, one of her, like, ventilation tubes or whatever gets mm-hmm. knocked out. So then she's contaminated and Ahsoka's like, I'm sorry. And Padme's just, like, really chill about the situation. She She's... She's a level-headed person that understands the situation. She's like, hey, we're in a war. Like, this is bound to happen. Yeah, right? she she says, don't blame yourself. These things tend to happen in a war zone. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't think so, Ahsoka should have probably blamed herself anyway. Yeah, because clearly it was nothing of her doing right. at all. And I don't uh, know that I'm going to stick up for Jar Jar here. Like, I don't think that he should probably blame himself either. Not really. It's, no, he. It's he, a fault yeah. of circumstance. I don't know what it's he was a doing. Fault of person. Yes, exactly. So I yeah. Either way, her suit's compromised. She's real chill about it. Um, then we cut back to Anakin and Obi Wan, who are with Jabo, and they're descending down some some cliff face. Like they're scrambling down. Yeah. Uh, they're climbing down a cliff, and I and I do want to say real quick. Uh, the the place that they landed is a city called Cliffhold, which, uh-huh. like, good for whoever named that. These are <laughs> conventional naming techniques, uh, which I think is fine. You know, I don't have a problem I mean, with that. I grew I, up in a city called Grand Rapids. I live near two rivers, one called the Mississippi and one called the Missouri, and... <laughs> Missouri River is in the state of Missouri, and I think it's Mississippi yep. that means muddy water, and uh, Missouri means or Missouri means muddy water, and Mississippi means muddy something else. I'm not really sure. Uh, yeah, but they're descriptors of things and where you're at. So yeah, great. You know, it totally works. But um, there are. 
all the buildings are kind of like spire shaped, right? And I don't know mm-hmm. if you notice, but they either have some of them have like marquees or they have like raised arbash lettering on them. So uh, they're they're a this is like a forgotten uh, like Atlantic City or something like that, mm-hmm. where you know the these buildings used to be big and grandiose and and they had names and titles and stuff. And here are the names of some of the some of the buildings we've got uh sir what is this sir kuski kus mm-hmm. frontier inn um Diego casino imperial nice. palace uh sivu play <laughs> and the final one is crystal skull ah very nice so we do have the building of the crystal skull uh so I mean, you know, I don't know where that name could have come from. When did Cannot when did Crystal imagine. Skull come out? Two thousand eight. Two thousand eight. Yeah. Yep. So so summer two thousand eight. So yeah. This is spelled K R I S T A L L. So I hmm. don't think this is where Indiana Jones went in that no. movie. Nope. Definitely not. Hmm. But possibly Han Solo getting his Crystal Skull business. Could be. The one that shows up in uh, Dryden's office. Oh, maybe maybe this is where Dryden got it. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sure there's an actual backstory to that skull that is not in my brain hole right now, but we'll... (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) There is that crystal skull that shows up in Dryden Dryden Voss's uh, office, so... Yeah, I think we talked about this off mic. Like, there's the Shankara stones and the crystal skull and... Uh, the fertility idol. Yep, the idol's in there. Like, there's nice. definitely some some Indiana Jones shit going on. Mm-hmm. So there's a definite crossover for the uh, all I, up in there. So that being said, I hope in Indy Five, which I'm okay with that being pushed back a year, uh, yeah. mainly because nobody was fucking doing anything with it. So to like push yeah. it out would have been a dumb idea. Um. But I am hoping, and I'm pretty sure, fingers crossed, that uh, what we're going to see in that movie is Darth Maul. (laughs) Because it all makes sense. Just fully uh, latching in there, yeah. Yeah. It's going to be good. I I just personally... Indiana Jones is... It's going to be like Indiana Jones and the robotic leg um, (laughs) finding. Spider legs. So what that's what era happen. are you hope do you hope Indy Five is still in the the fifties and sixties of It's gotta be in like Red the, Scare. It's gotta be in like the seventies. It's I don't know. <laughs> Indies fighting disco? Like what is <sighs> I don't know. Right? Do you wanna see Indiana Jones in a disco era? Is it gonna be like late Vietnam War era? Maybe yeah, maybe if it's dealing with Vietnam shit in the sixties. You, you, I'm sure there's some weird, deep Vietnamese legend that they can come up with that I'm even not familiar with, right? Like, yeah, I don't know. There's a lot of cave systems and jungle in Vietnam that surely you could hide some monster in there. It's um, it's tough. And I will say that I hope with... Um, uh, forgive me, but who is writing that? And is I don't no know longer. who's writing any. I don't know who's writing any five. I haven't been paying, paying attention to oh. any of that. Actually, all right, we'll talk about that off off mic then. Yeah. Uh, I just know it got pushed back so that Steven Spielberg is now directing the West Side Story remake. Yes. So that's the thing that's happening. And there's <laughs> there's a there's a change in who is penning the script as well. For West Side Story? No, for Indy Five. Or for Indy Five? Okay. Yeah. So. Yeah. We're going to we're going to leave that we're, we will come back. I promise you, even if it's just me, we're going to have we're going to have at least me and hopefully me and Lorenzo talking about Indy 5 after that comes out uh here oh, yeah. in a couple of years oh, I'll, and I'll watch it. I'm excited. That's going to be the shit. I'll uh, definitely watch it. So, we're looking for some some roots though, not some whips. Yes. Um so they're they're scrambling down this cliff face. 
Uh, Jabo gives them like a shit ton of warnings, like don't touch the vines. The plants don't like it. They're they all bite. like they're all like ambiguous warnings though, and it's only when they're like already on the cliff face that he's like, oh, by the way, don't do this, this, and this. And they're like, yeah, which why? Like I don't know because they don't like it. Like fucking. Wouldn't whatever. you explain that on the way to the thing? Whatever. We've had this conversation before with like every time they do a scene change and they bring up shit that should have been brought up. Yeah. On on route. But no, sure, right? At this what the fuck else were you talking about on the way, right? Right. Were you getting fucking like lunch recommendations? Like these flying Zandu things. Which yeah. is this weird giant kind of bat creature. Yeah, um, bat pterodactyl looking sort of motherfucker. They are uh, classified as Mamavian, which I guess is like in avian mammal i'm not really sure uh they have wings and they have arms and they have winged legs yes yeah um i noticed the winged legs but okay, so yeah so essentially what happens really quickly before you continue is um the reason we know this is because Jabo warns them about the Zandus, and Anakin immediately is like, what the fuck is a Zandu? And then immediately a Zandu pops out of the fucking cave. Mm-hmm. Anakin grabs on to the Zandu. There's, like, one leg that's kind of hanging down with Anakin on it. And Anakin's like, hey, hop on. And then Obi-Wan also grabs a leg, and they they ride that Zandu down to the, like, cliff, whatever at the is at the bottom of the fucking cliff. It's so. at the bottom of the Super Valley. Yeah. yeah, the Super Valley area. So, and by uh, the way, I can't believe that you forgot what a Super Valley was. I'm call. I'm gonna call you out in front of everybody. I honestly don't. You fucking I, forgot what a I Super vaguely Valley was. remember this reference, but no, it's it's completely gone from my head now. We're talking uh, months back, right? Yes, but that's yeah. Got nope. It's you all get, gone. You got no excuses, man. No, 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 it's all gone. So I called this the uh, the Xanadu Uber ride to the bottom of the Super Valley, and Xanadu. they get down there and inadvertently I think they disrupt. Uh, they must have touched a vine or something because this, yeah. they awaken some viney monster thing, yeah. and um, it literally to me looks like a Super Mario boss. Uh, it totally does. It it's, looks like a piranha plant without the red and white. It's like Base a combination markings. piranha plant and uh, Venus flytrap. Yes, exactly. Uh, but so Obi Wan is like, "All right, I'll take care of this. You, I don't know, do whatever." And Obi pulls out his lightsaber, and Anakin like pulls out a shovel, yeah, a gardening with, shovel with the shortest yeah, yeah. fucking handle I've ever seen. Yeah, and he uses this shovel to move one rock. Mm-hmm. And then kind of stares into a hole in the ground and then pulls out the root that is the exact, exact <laughs> yep. image of the hologram that they saw earlier. Yep. The exact same mark, uh, the, the, the structure, all of it. I, I noticed that as well. It was definitely the same. Again, control C, control V. Mm-hmm. Uh, so then they climb out and they have uh, very little trouble dispatching with these uh, giant plant things that I forgot the name of. Yeah, I don't, I don't. They weren't named. I didn't look it up. I just moved on with my life at that yeah. point because <laughs> it, it was it happened very quickly. I felt like I did look it up, but I'm not seeing it on my uh, list of tabs open on uh, I don't know, whatever type of internet I use on my computer. <laughs> I don't, anyway, it doesn't so. Matter. Moving on, uh, they enter back into the city. Jabo does kind of give a history of the planet and mentions that it used to be like a thriving planet, but now it's just a backwater planet because like the spice running dried up in the area. Yeah, so I guess there used to be spice on the planet, and then yeah. now there isn't, and now so nobody this, gives a shit. Yeah, this is when Davy Jones shows up and starts ranting about the fucking curse. Oh, uh, okay. I thought that was earlier. My bad. Nope. This is when that dude shows up. Curse is explained. Even brings up a hologram of a dude named Takito being electrocuted as he's trying to escape planet. 
I thought this was hilarious. He's like, you don't believe in the curse? Look at this. And then yeah. there's like a guy in a fucking chair like, bah! like and It's no... like a super private video, too. Where the fuck did he get this shit? It doesn't right? matter because it's it, like, it's out of fucking context anyway. It's like, you don't believe that the earth is round? Look at this, tides. Yeah. And Take that's a it. look at all of this. That's look it. at this There's, picture that I have in my wallet. How do you explain tides? Right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. But it's not Lorenzo? even that. It's, it's a video of a specific dude who is, it's confusing because then j brings up like, oh, I know this guy. That's Taquito. But well, maybe Taquito he's a friend and of Taco J-Bo. and fucking Burrito were sitting around and they found this chair in the garbage or whatever, or they built it out of fucking phone books at their frat house, and then they're just like tasing each other and somebody's videoing <laughs> it. Like that could be what it is. I don't fucking yeah. know. But but what's weird is no, it's you live in St. Louis area i live in la area i go to a party out here somebody tells me about something in missouri and then shows me a video of you that would not be cool right but that's what i'm saying this is this is the situation that is happening davy jones and jabo as far as we know do not know each other i feel like they do though i guess you got the vibe that they don't I got the vibe that they don't only again because there is so little context of who the fuck this guy is as he literally comes out from the fucking alley of Diego and does exactly what you say. It's like, oh, there's a ghost out there. You got to watch out for the spirits of Big Thunder Mountain. That's why the trains are haunted. Right? Like, um, okay. so there's. There's nothing in the introduction between Jabo and uh, 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 um, Amit. I'm just gonna call. I'm gonna pronounce it Amit. A M I T. Amit. Yeah. Amit. So, Amit. Yeah. So Amit and Jabo. There's nothing in their body language. There's nothing in the animation. There's nothing in anything they say that makes me understand that these two guys have met. Had any prior relationship? Yeah. They are just. Two homeless people that happen to be around the same area. Yeah, of so there's town. not even like any gay for pay going on here. No, just gotcha. they. This dude just pops on up and I was like, "I hear you talking about the curse. You're foolish to not believe." Um. So, anyways, uh, Anakin and Obi Wan both are like, "We we hear you." But we got to get the fuck out of here. So they leave. Anakin does kind of bring it up one more time. He's like, hey, we'll see if there's any actual ghosts, right? Like, there's mm-hmm. there's no way that there's a ghost, right? And Obi-Wan is like, well, there is something that is real, and we'll deal with the real thing. Yeah, the entirety of my notes for the next two minutes are Obi slash Annie try to leave slash lasers. Yep. So sensors get tripped. They show like this whole energy field being activated. It's lasers kind of popping from one asteroid potato to the next. And it just kind of uh, creates this interlocking web that is really hard to escape. Even though from a distance, it really looks like there's plenty of space to fly around. And Yeah, especially from, like, planet side, because being that far away, uh, when you were in the spacecraft seeing this, yeah, they look just as far away from each other as when you're planet side. So as close as they look when you're on a ship Mm post-atmosphere, it should just, the entire sky should be fucking lighting up. Instead of this spider spider web network of not even I won't even say spider web, it should look yeah. like a spider web, but what it looks like is a fishing net. Yes, yeah, but a fishing net meant to catch a big ass dolphin, but right. you're running it through krill. Right, that's what it looks like to me. Yes, I agree with you, hundred percent. Right. I the, have the webbing in the net is I have questions about this. Do you want mm-hmm. me to bring them up now? Sure, let's go. For, yeah. Okay. 
Uh, I will say that Obi Wan and Anakin are like, "Fuck lasers! We can't get past the lasers." Mm-hmm. Anakin's like, "Yeah, we can do it." And Obi Wan's like, "Nah, we're gonna get blown up. We're gonna get blowed up. It's gonna make us dead. That's not gonna be cool. Let's go back yeah. down to the planet." Turn Questions. the ship around. Is very, what happens. Yeah, very clever. Very nice. <laughs> Nicely done. Uh, why? <laughs> And this seems to also be a thing that humans do. Uh huh. Why can't you go up in space? I don't know. This is we've had this discussion. None of this makes any sense. The webbing is it. The webbing is in three D space. It it goes up. It goes down. Kind of. Sort of. Right. It's it's a it's it's enough to be scattered around because it. From my vantage point, it looks like it's it's not a single plane that is enveloping around the planet. It's also random, and I think that yeah. is why Obi Wan's like, "No, we gotta we gotta turn tail and fucking head back to where we are, yeah. where we were." Turn it upside down. Yes, got to go to Bespin. That's yeah, Family Guy. So. <laughs> To go Do you remember back that one? To Iago. Yeah. Uh, which one is that? First, second, or the third one? That's uh, something, something dark side. I believe that's the second one. Yeah. I think I have that on. That was, I yeah. believe, the first Blu ray that I ever got. Yeah, very nice. It yeah, because that's given uh, to me as yeah. a gift from a fellow yeah. restaurant manager back in the day. Very nice. No, that has to be the second one because of the lyrics exactly are uh, turn the ship around. Uh, Turn it, turn it upside or lay. Sorry, shit. Uh, lay it on its Leia side. Leia knows where Luke is. Turn uh, it upside down. Gotta go to Bespin. That's those are the lyrics. Clever. There you go. Yep. I don't know why I remember that one, but uh, uh, it's because of the show I did also see yesterday. So it's all, it's all. Uh, the, the for context for our listeners, I saw on your feet the musical Broadway show yesterday, which is the Gloria and Emilio Estefan uh, show about their lives. And uh, they do sing Turn the Beat Around. So that has been stuck in my head yeah. for the last uh, day and a half here. So <laughs> This is not the first time that I've heard about Gloria Estefan. Oh, such a good show. So fun. Anyways. Yeah. Yeah, I, I have okay, no next. explanation for this webby business and why they get fucked by it but we um, do agree that generally if you just uh pointed a different direction into space you'd probably oh, be safe they should have been fine okay. there's i they're just being then we'll, dumb pussies we'll, at this we'll point. skip that part um yeah. is there different sensors on all of these asteroids is that why it shoots from asteroid to asteroid or is it like a mineral confused. content? Maybe. I was confused by what the exact energy they called it the energy field. Uh-huh. And I was confused by what exactly was being tripped because the first thing they show is on the side of was it like one of the various moons? It or is something? one of the moons. And it was actually one of the moons. later we find out that that is uh, Milius, Milius Prime. yeah, Milius Prime, and this is where the angels are from. That uh, Anakin confused Padme of being an yes. angel, and there's actually angels. There are these uh, hyperluminous we'll get, we'll get there, beings. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So just real quick, like we'll we'll finish this out, then we'll get to Milius Prime. Um, so there's a big energy dish thing such as the one that shoots the laser from the Death Star. Yes. And in apparently this is like a prototype of that laser. Yes. Yeah. So that that's the first thing we see as they pass by it. Mm-hmm. So I saw the dish thingy, but then that thing starts charging up, which then creates the laser grid between the potatoes uh-huh. that are floating around in space. Right, um, and it shoots so then, from that to a potato, and then that yes. potato shoots out to other potatoes. 
Yeah, so this is where I got confused by what exactly was happening and what was triggering this whole chain of business anyways. So that basically cancels out the rest of my question since you don't have an answer to that one because yeah, I was yeah. also I was also thinking like why don't why doesn't all the debris like have anything to do with this? Why doesn't the debris uh trip this electrical field? Could they pull a Han Solo and, like, once you get into outer space, like, shut your ship down and pretend to be debris and just kind of yeah float and tumble your way out. And then once you get out, like, take off, see you later, and then you're good. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, there's, there's a lot of logic holes in this one. And there's I, just too many questions. Yeah, and again, uh, we brought this up at the beginning. There's just going to be a lot of questions in this one, and we have no answers. Yes. And and this is another one. They they never we we never get an explanation for what trips it and how this works and how do they know that the asteroids will consistently be in those same spots or is it all powered on like GPS? It's like oh well that one moved over here so throw. I think you might be going a little too complicated. I think that the actual electrical field, I, now I don't know what starts it to get the first charge to fire out of the moon, um, but I think that from that point forward, it works something like lightning. Okay. So Between, it's just going to the first nearest uh, path of least resistance? I guess. I mean, I'm not really. Sh- I'm, I don't, I'm not really sure how lightning works either. But I know that there are like charge charged particles that build up on yeah. the ground and build up in storm clouds, and like somehow magic happens, and Harry Potter uh, shakes his wand or mm-hmm. gets in a fight with Voldemort, and then the lightning happens. Right. Yes. So I think that it's something similar because then these asteroids question mark i mm-hmm. wasn't sure if they were asteroids or if they were like part of a destroyed moon or something because if there's a thousand moons around a fucking planet mm-hmm. there's bound to be collisions with moons yes yeah and then and then there is would be debris and mm-hmm. this debris has not coalesced into like rings or something like that yet yeah so amongst all of this debris even with a random pattern, there is some sort of artificial lightning generator that now why it goes from one to the next to the next to the next to the next. Mm-hmm. I don't have an answer for that. Yeah. Yeah. But as far as the randomness of of the pattern, that's mm-hmm. what I got. And that's why people okay. can't get out because they can't even like study the pattern and be like, okay, we'll go this way, that way, that way. Yeah. Because uh, there is none. Because like, there is no pattern. Yeah. Okay. That that makes sense. All right. So what? Uh, Ahsoka calls Anakin at this yes. at this point, and she's looking pretty pretty bad, and yep. uh, uh, she just calls to give him an update and saying, "Hey, everything's good here. Like we we stopped all the droids. Um, mm-hmm. The virus is Naboo contained. Is safe. Yeah. But we're we're not doing so hot. And then. Amidala steps Padme. in, yeah. and she says, uh, just promise me you'll never open open this hatch again. Mm-hmm. And she, st- she starts to say, I something. I don't know. And then connection cuts. Yep, and connection cuts connection out. cuts. And then Anakin basically goes into full panic. Super uh, full panic. Freaks the fuck out. Obi-Wan calms them down. And yeah, they got to argue that, with each other, and I've got a note that says uh, Obi-Wan gives Anakin a fortune cookie. Mm-hmm. And he says a great loop leap forward often requires taking two steps back, and then Anakin snaps back with, and sometimes all, all that it requires is the will to jump, which I thought both of these uh, were exactly like the fortune cookies that we see at the beginning of each of these episodes. Yeah, I agree. Those those were really well-written lines that landed really well, I in my opinion, yeah. Yes. They they definitely stood out uh cuz I like you I didn't even write down the the quotes, but I would have been able to recount that no problem. 
Right. Because uh, they were just, yeah, it was it was a good idea that got came across really well. But Obi-Wan claims to have some sort of idea, and he's asking Anakin to trust him. Yes. To, to follow his idea. So then... Then he calls, we, like, a city council meeting or something, and everybody, including um, the drunk... What's his name? Amit? Um, uh, yeah, Amit. So here's here's the thing, though. It's not a city council meeting. It okay. looks like it. It's at a round table. I did have to rewatch this scene a couple times just to confirm I wasn't crazy because I really thought he called in a meeting of city officials. Right. But you do notice the first thing that Obi-Wan says is citizens of Diego. Yeah. And then goes on his thing. Right, it's they a just, uh, it's a town yeah, hall. Jabo is sitting there, yeah, because like Jabo is fucking sitting at the round table, so he clearly is not on any sort of a city official business. So I don't think anybody there is actually in city official business. He's li- o- Obi Wan's literally just trying to get on a soapbox via yeah, this round table that he found. Uh, uh, he is trying to convince people. That the Earth is a spheroid type object when everybody yep. knows that the Earth is flat. Exactly. And yep. it just happens to be consistently accelerating upwards through space at 9.8 meters per second squared. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so he's With like. No yeah. means of propulsion or continuous acceleration. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So security system is brought up. And then Obi-Wan asks if anybody has inhabited the moons. And this is where said en- angel. Enter angels. Enter an angel. Actually, angel. Just one. Yeah. Just one. But it's never. N- this person is never named. And I did look this angel up on Wikipedia. And there is no name for the. This is the. One of the rare unnamed items. Yeah, what do you, what do you got across. for? Do you have a character at all, or are you just on the Angel Wikipedia page? I was trying to find the character name. Uh huh. And the Angel Wikipedia page just shows that it shows a screenshot from this episode, and it's the only appearance. Uh huh. According to this, but there's no character name listed in that whole page. Correct. Correct. There is no. Yeah. So there's no character name. We know that this is a species called the angels. There's there are character attributes that are listed on the Wikipedia page. Right. Um, this angel comes in and does mention that uh, they were peaceful until the separatists came, and that uh, she reveals that they lived on Milius Prime. Uh, so. Anakin makes a guess that the primary node m- must be by Milius Prime. I'm not sure where this conclusion really gets brought up. It's other o- than it's only made sense to me because uh-huh. basically um, Obi Wan is like, "Hey, did anybody ever live on these moons?" And they're like, "Yeah, the angels used to live there." And then this angel comes in and she's like, "Yeah, we don't live there anymore. We got run off when the Separatists were here." Mm-hmm. And and then, so at that point, Anakin's like, all right, well, the Separatists are clearly the ones that built this defense system, and the Angels used to live on Milius Prime, and now they don't, so let's go there. Well, like, the only thing that bothers me is that, so this is, there, there are a thousand moons, and they get one person to say that they're from one moon. Uh-huh. But there is no confirmation there that... There seem, seem to be a thousand people on this planet. Yeah, exactly. So there is no confirmation that there are not other people from other moons. That is correct. Right. So that's like me meeting somebody from China and then saying, well, that's the only other plant or the only other country outside of the United States because that's that's all I got. So therefore, everything else that is not within the borders of the United States exists only in china that's probably why um unintelligent americans think that all people of asian descent are either from 
China or Japan. China or Japan. Yep. Oh yeah, that was my. Uh, and definitely not Grand Rapids, Michigan. Oh yeah, not at all. No. Yeah. No, I've never wanted to punch anybody in the face for asking me dumbass shit like that. So. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's not a thing I've ever had to deal with ever. So I, w- I wouldn't think so. <laughs> yeah, I especially d- not in Grand Rapids, Michigan. I did definitely not at a grocery store either. <laughs> uh, I did just double check, and in the credits of this episode, uh, this character is just named as Angel. Yeah, see? Uh, yeah. She is voiced by uh, Catherine Tabor, who does the voice of Padme Amidala. So. Ah, nice. Yeah. We got that. It is an interesting um, character design on this, this Angel, which is it's only important to note here because it is a thing that Anakin brings up the first time we essentially meet him. Mm -hmm. It's the first thing we hear him say. Correct? Are you an angel? I think so. That sounds correct. I believe that's... Doesn't... What does she say? What do you mean? Yeah, she she says what? He goes, yeah, an angel. They're from the moons of Diego, I think. Mm -hmm. Exactly. I hear all the deep space pilots talk about them, which I guess those are just like rum runners. Which would... That makes sense for the planet that we meet Anakin on. Uh huh. Right. It totally does. So, so what bother the? Uh, now that I'm bringing that up, what bothers me is that Anakin does not express any sort of excitement. I get that he's emotionally charged at the moment. Yeah, he should. Uh, there should be some sort of um, like remembrance connection or something going yeah. on here. Or like, like a full like they do like, exist, oh, even if. Even if it's just on the way mm-hmm. where he's like, dude, Obi-Wan, like, we're going to Diego. Ye- like, I fucking just reiterate exactly what you said back in The Phantom Menace. Like, I heard that there's angels that live on these moons. Mm-hmm. I used to think Padme was an angel. Wasn't I adult? Yeah, exactly. So it's it's just a it's a strange missed opportunity in terms of everything else we've been talking about of them being able to make these connections. And this is a big one where they're like, Hey, how about we take that idea that he said there, throw it here, but then they don't follow through on everything that should be happening. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. But, uh, this is a good place for a callback and a tie in and they didn't do it. Exactly. When sometimes their callbacks and tie-ins seem a little forced. Completely forced sometimes. Uh, So anyways, yeah, we finally see one of these angels. Uh, She is luminescent. Her skin is literally glowing and casting light on things around her. Luminous beings they are. Yes. Uh, She looks pretty much like a classy version of the alien from the X-Files episode of The Simpsons, hmm. which if you recall that, turned out to be Mr. Burns uh, glowing off the nuclear radiation. You know what's funny is that I do not remember that episode, but I did play uh, Simpsons Tapped Out, the mobile game for a long time, uh-huh. and I did earn that character, so I know what you're talking about. Yep. The one that shows up and it's like, I bring you love. Is yeah. that love between a man and a woman, or a man is fine Cuban cigars? <laughs> I bring you love. Right. Yep. Uh, big old Simpsons fan. So, anyways, moving on. That's what it. That's exactly what she looked like to me. Just the weird, floaty, ethereal being. She has wings that are. She kind does of, have wings. Uh, but she's also she wearing has a cloak, six so. wings. Yes. Uh, she is dressed in some kind of elvish Lord of the Rings type woodland attire. Yes, exactly, yeah. Um that's a good description of that for sure. Yeah, and it and does like include a hood. She 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 had the hood up. Right? Hood is up. Hood is up. So she was hood up on that one. She so wearing green and brown. Yep, so we finally got a view of this angel and again, so Anakin doesn't think anything of it but uh, but he guesses the primary node comes from milius prime so then 
in the door behind the unnamed angel that walks in. The door remains open, and Obi-Wan spots some vulture droids back there and asks uh, Jabo if he is able to activate those droids. Jabo is like, well, sure thing. Yeah, that I can do. And uh, so... I just lost it. Um, so this clones? is where this is where they come up with their plan, and Obi Wan's plan is to to um, send some vulture droids out into space to distract. He says something like distract the the lightning lasers, right? Yeah, something like that to but draw the lasers away from their ship. But seeing as we just determined that it's like a completely random pattern, yeah, that's not an effective means for the plan, and mm-hmm. none of them actually do that. Uh, but no, what yeah. they do is they fly. They have a destination that they're flying towards short term, um, mm-hmm. before they get into the depths of this giant spider web laser field, energy field, yeah. and it's where the satellite dish is on Milius Prime. Mm-hmm. Uh, which begs the question, are there more Milius moons? I don't know. Yeah. I have no answer to that. I only have questions. But uh, so many questions. They blow the satellite laser emitter thing up rather mm-hmm. easily. And yes. then they just kind of boogie out of town. And they. Anakin does radio back to uh, J Bo Hood and. He's like, yep, we're all good. And Obi-Wan's like, sorry we blowed up your droids, man. You're going to have to find uh, some other ones. Mm-hmm. And Anakin, But at least you can leave planet now. Yeah, Obi-Wan says at least you can leave whenever you want. So mm-hmm. peace out. And they you leave. good to go. And, and they... Then... But, so before this... Uh, was there any more Naboo stuff before that? There was a quick scene of the... There are. There is one confirmed clone to have died okay uh rex or somebody is covering up the clone with a blanket did they Uh, die on screen do i count this as a clone death uh you know i don't you're gonna want to go back and double check i don't recall if you see the clone moving before and then no more movement right Uh, so you don't know if you see him expire yeah i'm not sure if he expires on screen okay but at the right after that, Ahsoka goes down. She completely goes down, and then we cut back to uh, the attempt of uh, flying into space with Vulture droids, and then exactly what we just talked about. Things work out well. Then we cut back to Naboo, and it's a very kind of abrupt cut to me. Yeah, um, it ends real fast. Um, yeah, I have one note that says they defeat Droll pretty quick, and from planet side, it kind of looks like really far away fireworks. Mm-hmm. And then uh, the next note I have is that there's an Annie Padme reunion. Yeah, uh, so med droids the, are pulling out. Uh, they they they're they're carrying a stretcher. Yep, they're not, Padme's on the stretcher. Yeah, it's just floating. They're not carrying it. I don't even or, think yeah. they're pushing it. Yeah, they're just kind of walking alongside this self-moving stretcher right padme's on it they're talking they're having a conversation and mm-hmm. they she looks bad but yeah she's but they aware. clearly have administered the antidote at this point right so here's uh i'm going back to something you said earlier mm-hmm. so how the fuck did they get these people out of there they just oh. let the virus out that's that's why this jump is abrupt to me there are so many questions about this moment that skips over so much other attention they could have kind of drawn out. I could have done with a little less J Bo and a little bit more uh what they did with the contaminated like how do you how at this point do you get into the hatch mm-hmm. without contaminating everything? Because exactly. this blue shadow virus is supposed to be deadly or destroy anything that is carbon based yeah that breathes it in and gets a whiff of it so how do you contain that after while still trying to extract people out like is there there has to be an airlock somewhere maybe 
Right. So does that mean that there's like a bubble of contaminated air under? Yeah. It's can you, the fucking can Chernobyl you fil- of... Can you filter it? Can you... I, it's a virus, right? Like, I mean, I guess you can kill it. Like, you can burn it up, right? Well, you can't burn it up, but you gotta, like... When you wave the stick at it. Sterilize the air? I mean, It's right? afraid... It's afraid... It's afraid of the stick. Right. From <laughs> the angry, toothed vine plant. I, yeah, I guess. You no. throw the stick at it. <laughs> yeah, so I... No, this... this I agree with you that there needs to be less j especially because the entire episode has been Anakin freaking out about the whole Padme situation, and then it just wraps up. Mm-hmm. There needs to be... There should be, like, a little something. Um, Some tension... There's They try and throw in tension of Ahsoka going down, but then that shouldn't have been the focus. The whole focus was Anakin freaking out about Padme. But it never, other than the fact that she is exposed, they they don't show her in any like grave danger. Like she's uh, getting some blue veins on her skin. Yeah, there's well, a progression I think that of the was disease. the setup from the episode before. Of how dangerous this stuff is. Yeah, but, but again, there's there's no tension to what is happening. Yes. Right? So like watching let's, somebody let's just wrap up get, the rest yeah. of this plot, which mm-hmm. there isn't any. We just no. have some dialogue. Yeah. Um, and I have some of the dialogue written down if you want to review it. Yeah, if not, yeah, yeah. it's kind of whatever. Let's just say, yeah, so like the main points are uh, Medroid... Uh, full recovery expected from uh, Anakin says to Padme. Mm-hmm. Uh, Obi Wan talks to Jar Jar. Padme suggests training Jar Jar. Yeah, so this is like a gag because like Jar Jar can't even get his fucking helmet off, and then mm-hmm. Anakin, or Obi Wan helps him take his helmet off, which his ears, by the way, not tucked down like the neck and the back. They're just like in the back of the helmet. They're folded into the which helmet somewhere. Is, even less comfortable but then yeah. obi-wan uh basically says oh padme padme suggested that maybe you should have some like arms training mm-hmm. um to be and, able to fire that gun that he where he fucked shit up before yeah, yeah. so eh, yep. you know i don't know that that's a terrible idea i don't know no. it's a great idea but yeah. we'll see but anyways and then the last thing we get is anakin talks to ahsoka uh-huh. who is then shown alive again the last time we saw her she passes out and then there's not even like a surprise like hold off on like, like I mean the that end she's of still the alive. Yeah, it's just like oh he just turns around and it's like so how you doing Ahsoka? Oh great, cool. Like mm-hmm. there's there's nothing like even like the last twenty seconds of like the fucking aha take on me music video like you're trying to figure out if the fucking draw drawing dude is dead or alive right like, right. Yeah, but in this one, like they they try and play it off like she fucking dies in the bunker, and then oh nope, she's just lying on a stretcher, right? Talking, a okay, and then yeah, any and then cue loud music is what happens. So yeah, they have a little inner, they have a little dialogue back and forth where Anakin like congratulates her, and she's like, oh, it's all because of your training. And then he's like, mm-hmm. yep, you're right, I should take all yep. the credit. Fantastic, well, at least most of it. Mm. And then she says something something else back, and that's their little lovey-dovey moment to each other. And so yeah. they understand each other and whatever. And then, yeah, cue loud music. Um, J-Bo Hood is voiced by David Kaufman, who I did not recognize as a name, but I do recognize nope. the name of who he is known to also do the voice of, and that's Danny Phantom. Ah, interesting. I... The in, the first time that I saw this episode ten years ago or whatever it was, mm-hmm. when I heard this kid's voice and saw his demeanor and stuff, just envisioned mm-hmm. Christian Slater the entire time. Really? Yes. I see that. I I yeah. I I I get what you mean. Yeah. So and more specifically, like Christian Slater, uh, still with the '90s haircut, but in 
Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves. <laughs> okay, yeah. Uh, that's another deep pull from that weird Robin Hood era of you know, I don't things. remember his name. William, maybe? I don't I don't even recall anything uh, really. He gets he gets shot through the hand with an arrow. See that that's was, that's that not the Robin cool. Hood I remember from the nineties. The one I'm gonna remember is uh Robin Hood Men in Tights. Yeah, of course. That's that's everybody the, remembers that one. Dave Chappelle, baby. Uh <laughs> so Mel Brooks yeah. directing Dave Chappelle and uh Carrie Elwes. Anyways. So should we we've we've gone long this one we've definitely gone very long on. So yeah. <laughs> should we start wrapping this shit up? I think we need to. What, yeah, what do you what do you think about this one, buddy? Uh I give this a thumbs up. Okay. I like it. It's I have I have a lot of they should have done this instead of this type deal. Mm-hmm. Um they should have had a little bit less J Bo Hood. Yeah. They should have had a little bit more of this goings on on Naboo. I think mm. they should have pulled Padme out of the situation. And mm. I think the person that should have been in peril should have been Ahsoka and Rex. Like the whole yeah. point of Yoda giving Ahsoka as a Padawan to Anakin is so that he can learn to let go. Mm-hmm. And this would have been a great near ending to season one where, and even if this was like the end of season one, right? Mm-hmm. Where it's like, Oh shit. Anakin's, uh, Anakin's Padawan, right? Is in peril and he's, he's got to fucking figure out how to fix it. And then somewhere along the line in this, in this story, he needs to accept the fact that it's not going to happen. And it's by doing that, that he is able to make it happen and yeah. therefore takes a character step forward. Mm-hmm. That being said, I do like the, this as a part two to blue shadow virus. Yeah. Okay. Cool. What you get? I am. I'm pretty much gonna agree with you. This one is just a. It's it's right at the edge. I will tip my thumb up. With you. Again, I still have a lot of complaints this one this one is not as strong of an episode as the previous one to me it, the, the fact that we're going back to this a b structure um after a few episodes of really strong just one clear plot line uh we get introduced to characters that i really just don't care about and then especially like it's it's entertaining as the episode's going by and but then really that ending really just it, it really just bites it at the ending, um, which I think if it had if, if it had closed strong, it would have made me feel better about it. But the fact that, you know, the, the last thing I'm seeing in this whole episode is just like me going, wait, but what about but how did we get but oh, OK, like I think if they would have just flip flopped the amount of time that they spent with uh, J Bo and the amount of time that they spent in the the secret lab, yeah, then it would have balanced out better. And I'm guessing that the reason they didn't do that is because they just spent almost a full episode in the lab, mm-hmm. so to kind of expand outside of uh, what what you've seen for half of an episode. So, yeah. And maybe if, you know, you go to Iego and uh, the big thing there is angels and not j Yeah. It's just, uh, j just as a character was, he's fine. He wasn't annoying. He wasn't, it, but it was just whatever. Um, but nonetheless, it, as just a basic episode, it's, it's entertaining while it's, going on is just in this looking back at it there are so many logic holes that you could either easily poke through Mm -hmm. 
but while it's happening like it's it's you know the one shot aside like it's it's well animated the 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 few fight scenes that we do get between the droids and the um uh the clones trapped mm-hmm. in the bunker they're they're well done mm-hmm. uh visually speaking the details like uh, of the the debris that's surrounding the planet you know it's 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 all well done uh, uh so it's 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 enough for me to not want to shit on this episode like terribly much right um yeah it, it, it's put together it's it's a it's a put together episode it just it's not the, it's not the worst episode i've seen it's not the strongest one you know? right so it's 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 enough for me to just tip it up you know to be like hey this is this is a fine episode this is nice. a, this is an okay episode so nice yeah, yeah right so yeah it works for me i'll yeah i'll tip it that way so any, anything else you got? La- yeah, the only thing uh, else that I can say is um, just to reiterate what we both said, and when you when you take into consideration that Blue Shadow Virus and Mystery of a Thousand Moons were played back to back, you get a nice little forty minute story. Yeah, I agree. It's it's a good it's a good flowing. Yeah, it's a decent two parter. Yeah. 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 So so. That being said, um, if you disagree with us, let us know. Hit me up on Twitter and tell me I'm wrong. I'm cool with that. I don't mind at all. Uh, you can find us at Not the Nerds on Twitter. Uh, if you prefer Facebook, at the Nerds, Not the Nerds podcast. Uh, if you want to do the old email route, uh, that's not the nerds podcast at gmail.com i avoided oh. putting two ats in that one this time which i normally <laughs> don't uh shouts out to kevin warren you can find him on twitter at they call me k-dub he's our illustrator and then we've got our uh, music professional Lindsay, over at strange fantasy music at gmail.com yeah so that's all the shouts out i got for this week we are headed next week um to storm over Ryloth. Just trying to see if we had a time jump. We did forget to say that between Trespass and Blue Shadow, which was last week and two weeks ago, we had a single week time jump. Or a single episode time jump, but Yes. Uh from here to the end of season one, which is approaching pretty quickly. It's three more episodes, and we'll be solid into season two of the Clone Wars. Mm-hmm. So, but we're going one nineteen with Storm of Ryloth, one twenty with Innocence of Ryloth, one twenty one with Liberty of Ryloth or Liberty on Ryloth. So I'm gonna go ahead and say that I think that this is probably a three part story arc that we're finishing out that season with. That sounds uh, logical to me. So mm-hmm. we'll see what uh, what those Twi'leks bring. <laughs> to us over the next three weeks. And right, in, I can't wait. Yeah. Until then, uh, the earth is flat, I guess. <laughs> the earth is flat. The earth is flat. And tides go in, tides go out. Can't explain that. Tides go in, tides go out. Can't explain that. And Vaccinate then, your uh, kids. Turn the ship around. This is the <laughs> end of the episode. <laughs> Uh, See you next week, everybody. (laughs) Bye, nerds.